Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining and welcome back to Wall Street Silver. Joining us today is Mike McGlone, Senior Commodity Strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence. Mike, glad to have you back. Hello, Ivan. Thanks for having me back. I, I love that red chair. I find it intimidating, <laughs> but I'll do yeah. my best to, to keep up with you. I appreciate having you uh, back on to talk about the markets. There's so much confusion in the markets right now, Mike. Every time someone mentions AI, their stock goes up. What are you watching closely in the markets right now uh, as as the market develops? Um, I, I the key thing I'm watching is this, um, I would say, unstoppable rally in the stock market despite... And, and the tilt towards, oh, it's different this time. We're not going to have a recession despite the biggest pump in liquidity that's dumping at the highest pace ever. And despite the tilt towards recession in Europe and the um, scramble for fiscal st and monetary stimulus out of China, it's it's global. Mm -hmm. um, and the U.S. stock market remains the shining star. And we're taping this on, uh, the you know, and maybe an hour before the Fed tightens in July. And that that's the fact. The Fed's still tightening and there's still price for more tightening. They're probably going to be hawkish. And I look at it as this risk asset rally is fighting the Fed and is at much greater risk of reverting. And yes, I've been early. Yes, I've been wrong lately, but there's significant signs of that tilting that way. And I like to point out um, we have Producer price index year over year, um, finished goods is running minus 3%. That's only happened three times in history. And the most wow. recent time was, yeah, it was right when COVID started. And the most notable time was when it plunged during the great financial crisis. It dropped 6%, a little bit more. Mm -hmm. The Fed was almost every single time the Fed was either focused on easing or easing. This has never happened. And then we have money supply dropping about the same 4% to, you know, on, on a year over year basis, the US money supply. Now it's virtually that never really mattered, but when it pumps up to 26% and then the highest ever, and it goes down to 3%, that matters. So I, I look at this as the market I think is in potentially a silly stage. Right. Just recently, one thing I like to watch is you look at the NASDAQ um, versus its 50 week moving average. It recently got to 25%. That's been the resistance threshold since the all-time high versus this measure in uh, 2000. I remember mm -hmm. that, and that was yes, that was <laughs> early, but then it corrected almost 80 percent. Right. And I see similar risks. So the key thing I'm really focusing on is at what point will the Fed stop tightening? I'm looking at my WIRP function on the Bloomberg, and it looks to me like they're probably not going to stop hiking until the stock market tells them to. Now, so far, the stock market's tell them to keep hiking, told them right. to keep hiking, and they have. Um, and we have, at the moment, <clears throat> you know, we haven't, we, at the point you're going to publish this, we ha we, we're going to hear from the Federal Chairman, Federal Reserve Chairman, but futures are priced for um, continued vigilance, which I right. think is appropriate. And I think it's part of that lose-lose. They're just going to keep hiking until the stock market goes down. And as our chief strategist, Ira Jersey says, Jersey says, they're very unlikely to cut rates until unemployment goes up, which means recession virtually guaranteed. Yet the market's priced that we're not going to have that. So what happens if the stock market just doesn't go down and they just keep raising yeah. rates, keep raising rates, and it's stuck in this, like what you said, that silly stage of that spiral of it, the stock market keep pumping up while uh, the Fed keeps raising rates. And uh, what if there's just no control for that, Mike? What, well, that'd what be great. If, it'll be great if the stock market doesn't go down okay. um, and they stop raising rates as their measures of inflation plunge. Um, the key things they watch, our employment cost index is running just below 5%, and personal consumption expenditures, these core measures that are really sticky. Um, our economists said these are going to stay sticky. So that means the Fed's going to stay um, vigilant, but you also have to kind of, for me, for um, us not to have kind of a reciprocal reaction to the biggest pump in liquidity in history that's dumping, um, we'll probably have to rewrite the textbooks and, and histories of and lessons of economics. And I'm happy to do that from the future. <laughs> um, but, you, you know, my bias is still, I, I've earned that nickname, Mick Gloom. And I like to say, well, if there's a hurricane coming and I don't warn you and you're, you are hurt, then I'm at uh, risk. I mean, that it's 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 uh, that would be inappropriate. So that's what I'm doing. I'm just simply warning that. So I do see right. things. I see. Um, you know, right now we have that two-year note running five percent, about five percent, and I still think yes, there's a high levels of cash. I still think that's um, it's it's appropriate for investors to overweight things mm -hmm. like that and underweight risk assets like 
stock market and cryptos. Cryptos are to me a potential. The, the way I see this, if I'm right about what I see is potentially this most significant economic reset of our lifetimes. Right. If I'm right about that, the leading rapidly advancing revolutionary technology that led this rally, cryptos, notably Bitcoin, should lead on the way down. And that's been happening. Bitcoin's been unable to get above 30,000. I don't know if we want to go there right away. And it's showing that divergent weakness that I had, I expect will continue to um, play out. And of course, what are going to be the bumps in the road? I don't know. The bottom line is, if you're long risk assets, great. I'm glad you've done well, but you're still fighting the Fed. And <laughs> yeah, the rules don't fight the Fed. Yeah, absolutely. And where do you see, uh, as as this recession heats up, and you said a little bit earlier, with everything how it plays out, a recession is guaranteed. Where do you see gold and where do you see precious metals? Where do you see silver going? Well, see, the thing is, I don't, it's not say guaranteed. Nothing's guaranteed. Yeah, yeah, of course. Death and, death and taxes. But um, <laughs> let's look at the New York Fed probability recession from the yield curve is the highest since 1982. Um, uh, certainly from a yield curve standpoint, it's all tick, tick, tracking that way. We've never seen PPI collapse like this with the Fed still tightening. Those rules of economics are, are poor. So I think gold is going to be the, one of the best performing assets and still continue. So here's a unique thing. At this date, right as July 26, on a 12-month basis, gold, copper, the S&P 500, and the Bloomberg Galaxy Crypto Index are all up about the same on a 12-month right. basis, around 15%. The next 12 months, I see gold as the most likely to continue to outperform that bias, particularly if we just get a little bit of reversion in the stock market because everything will trickle down from there i see copper continuing the bear market copper right now and what is i check it's around 389 mm -hmm. um an ounce, uh, a pound i think is more likely to go to three that's nothing not significant at all and unlikely to sustain above four for a while until we come out of this malaise and um get some well past a a, a a decent amount of lag from significant amount of Federal Reserve easing and right. time for China and, and Europe and U.S. to come out of these recessions. And I think that'll come. And, you know, we'll see what happens with stimulus there. And silver is, to me, more likely to trade more like um, copper. And it has since uh, for the last few years. Now, the silver's up um, this year. It's up, uh, what do we got, about um, – three to four percent the gold's up eight percent right to me that's a potential to, to accelerate and that's the kind of trajectory you expect in a recession typically on a bull market silver should outperform gold <clears throat> mm -hmm. and, and and it hasn't um in some cases it has but it depends on how you measure it but um it's the bottom line that gold is way outperforming industrial metals way outperforming copper that's a global uh recessionary trajectory and the key question i ask is what stops it um most central banks are still tightening and, and we're depending on China to um, to stimulus, for stimulus, fiscal and monetary stimulus. And China is just almost a complete autocratic state now. I mean, it's yeah. Mr. Z everything. That's just a fact. Yeah. I mean, even their central banker is, um, they're all linked, um, recently, recently replaced. So I see gold is outperforming virtually most assets. And that's not so profound. So historically, gold has outperformed most commodities, particularly when you have to hold it and pay the storage costs. Um, um, but as we tilt towards recession, I see gold has been outperforming, outperforming copper for a couple of years now, and I, right. many years. And um, that was my metals outlook I did with my metals team last year. I stick with it. I just think that the fundamentals are stronger for that. So we need to have some kind of surprise, I think, um, that I can't predict. Absolutely. And we need to not have that normal tendency for markets to respond to Federal Reserve hiking the most ever and central banks hiking the most ever. Um, as we tilt towards recession and things like that, and housing peaks and all that fun stuff. So, absolutely. Um, well, I don't know what changes. To me, these are bodies and motions. And key point is we've had a significant bounce in risk assets. Which, here's the bottom line: we've had a bounce in all risk assets this year. The mm -hmm. question is what happens in the next 12 months. And I view silver, industrial metals, silver is more of industrial metals, much more susceptible than gold, the precious metal. So, and you absolutely nailed it. So, Mike, the news coming out, uh, there's a, a, like new news coming out last week of after months of debate on uh, various currencies and commodity baskets, China and Russia, they're settling uh, on gold as the basis of the new international lead system. How how hard are they pushing to <laughs> destabilize the U.S. dollar or is it all just smoke and mirrors? What do you think? Um, it's all of the above. I mean, they have no choice. They have melting currencies are trying to peg to the dollar and, and over time that never works and even right. all currencies for fiat currencies depreciate over time and the big issue now is the uh, u.s treasury 
um, you can clunk your money down with uh, in, in U.S. Treasuries and get five percent to your notes. You can get five and a quarter in a one-year bill now. That's and in the world's safest, most secure asset. Mm -hmm. It's hard to compete with, <laughs> and they're trying to compete with that. So to me, that's the key thing now is there is an alternative to risk assets, and the Federal Reserve is keeping it that way. So what you're seeing is that internal battle from countries, particularly these are the two most autocratically led countries in the world and supporting a war, both China and you know the unlimited friendship between Mr. Z and Mr. Putin and mm -hmm. the war, they're all related. Mm -hmm. um, is going to look, we're going to think we're going to look back at that history is that's not a good thing for their own countries and currencies. So I'm not worried, but the key bottom line is some of the deepest pockets on the planet, i.e. central banks and some of these plan these countries are all going for gold. Why? Because they have to, it's default. Their only all alternative is the dollar. And what's the difference between gold and the dollar? Obviously it's the paper, but you get 5% <laughs> in that dollar <laughs> right now on a base layer. That's competition for gold. And if you're buying US assets in the US stock market, you're getting a tremendous return this year. You're up 17% in the S&P 500. Those are major headwinds for gold that I think are gonna go away when we get a Fed pivot. What's gonna take for a Fed, 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 Fed pivot? The number one factor, I think, to, for it to happen sooner is for the U.S. stock market to go down. So to me, wow. that is something that has happened, that has not has happened. That's part of what's pressure gold, even though it's still up 8% this year, almost 8%. And the question is, how much further can these stresses remain? So I'm, I think one thing you also need to be pointed out, it shows what's, what's happening is the absolute supremacy of the dollar, particularly with, uh, with this war. Um, and you're finding that out, China's pegged to the dollar. The Hong Kong dollar is pegged to the dollar. And they right. said they're going to potentially allow um, central bank digital currencies there, which means it's going to be pegged to the dollar. <laughs> so <laughs> to basically a crypto dollar. So it's I'm just showing how dominant the dollar is, even though people say it's not. Right. I like to say, well, good luck. Find another currency that's better and I hope you can get your 5% and your T-bills and get that money back and safe in the deepest liquid treasury market on the planet. Yeah, absolutely. And PacWest, have you seen the news with PacWest Bank this week? It had a massive drop in the stock price. And some are saying it's due to an emergency uh, merger between the two regional banks. Uh, they're saying that they need to get larger so that uh, that combined, they maybe get more systematic protection. What are you seeing with these regional banks, like what, especially with PacWest? Are you watching that? I saw it. I watched. I, I, not much of my focus. Yeah. But I, I, I like how you said that the emergency, um, what you call the emergency merger? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's kind of, that's a cool terminology, the NEM. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't think of it that way, but I appreciate you mentioning it. It makes sense. But here's the bottom line with this issue we had with the banking uh, money, still money still leaving banks, except for JP Morgan, right. and going for treasury bonds and money markets is still the case. And the main reason that created this problem with banks was this offset and duration in their treasuries is actually getting worse. The Fed is still hiking rates. Mm -hmm. um, and I look at this as this is a slow moving train wreck and part of the, what builds my base case for a significant economic reset of a lifetime. Now, I've said that for too long. I admit <laughs> that. I, you've seen it happening in producer prices. They've collapsed. Yeah, that's Greatest right. pace ever since 1948 from 18% right. to minus three. That's 22, 20, almost 23%. Um, peak to trial, it's never happened. And of yeah. course, our data is only to 1948, and that's so it's a pretty long time. Um, and a money supply collapsing, all those kind of things, and the big the big spike we had in housing prices that's all now negative. Um, all this stuff is still has that headwind, which is what I like to point out is when we had similar inklings like this in 2008 mm -hmm. and <clears throat> 2001, most of those 2008. <clears throat> The Fed was easy. Most central banks were easing aggressively, and we're still tightening. So simple, simple rule: don't fight the Fed. Yeah. And um, I, that's it's just a simple liquidity pool still happening. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Mike, it's such a huge pleasure having you uh, come down to talk about commodities, the markets, and everything uh, with the Federal Reserve. It's a huge pleasure, and uh, hopefully, as the market develops, we'd really love to have you back on. I've been looking forward to it, and see how things pan out the next time we come out. Yeah, huge pleasure. Talk to you soon, Mike. Thank you. 